Great. Well, I think we might make a start just um, because with these things, I think people do sometimes trickle in. Um, and so just so we have enough time to discuss um, what we're here to discuss today, Annika's work. Um, basically, I'm I'm just briefly chairing the beginning and then I'm going to have to leave before this is all finished. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce um, the two speakers today, Annika and Steve, who are going to be talking, actually I'm not totally sure that I know the format, but I think they're having a conversation um, inspired by Annika's excellent book. Um, and this is, um, you know, hosted by Border Criminologies. It's part of our new thematic strand on detention and deportation. We are still um, forming the group. So if people would like to be a part of it, please reach out to me or Andriani or indeed Annika. Um, and let us know. Um, we will be having um, events in the future. Um, you might want to mark in your calendar, February the 6th, there'll be a hybrid event on the cheery topic of violence and immigration detention, but we will be publicizing that um, later as well. So anyway, I'm going to hand over now to our two speakers and I will put myself on mute. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Mary, and thanks also to Andriani and to the Board of Criminologies for hosting and giving us a platform to hold this conversation, which is as much about the work that uh, Steve has been doing in other contexts, which has to do with um, um, struggles against borders, aggressive migration controls, and for the freedom to move and uh, settle and the dignity of all. And I'm really, really glad that you're with me today, Steve. Um, and uh, I'm sure that we'll be getting started a conversation that I hope will not finish after today on exactly violence in its various <laughs> manifestations in border contexts, um, you know, broadly defined. My pleasure also to be part of it with you. Thank you. Um, so what we will do today is to discuss or have a conversation around some of the different ways in which border violence works and how it produces and structures ex exposure to premature death. We will start or I will start with an intervention that focuses on the Danish deportation regime, more specifically its deportation camps. One which is a setting that Steve and I have come to know in different ways and through very different perspectives. But I think because we'll be talking about um, ways of knowing borders and ways of knowing border violence, we'll inevitably also have to be traveling elsewhere in the talk. So drawing links between logics and sites uh, of oppression. Unsurprisingly, we might mention Palestine, we might mention other places um, where we see direct and slow violence being leveraged against colonized or oppressed populations and where the voices of these populations are systemically delegitimized and misrecognized. So bear with us in this rather broad talk uh, and please do engage with us in the conversation as well. To open for you though, uh, we'd like to give you a sense of where our conversations actually started and where we first met and where we want to begin our talk today by showing a brief clip from a, another conversation that Steve had with the director of Shellsmark deportation camp in Denmark back in, I think, 2016, um, like a year after it had been opened. And this clip is from the film Castaway Souls, which Steve has directed to, and co-produced with Nana Hansen, Thomas Elstad and Thomas Fiddler. So I'm going to share my screen and just show you a one minute clip to give you a sense of where we will begin our conversation. I want to know how is this place being run? How long do someone have to be here? How long do I have to wait here? I cannot give you a personal answer because I simply don't know. Uh, we have no insight in the sort of individual case, which, which means that I don't know, really know your background or why you are here. Uh, what I do know is that you are supposed to be here, or that you have to be here. Uh, in the long run, uh, any uh, inhabitant uh, can stay here uh, eternally. So internally. Internally. So 
so what you saw here was uh, a clip where the setting is one of Denmark's now three deportation camps. I won't go into detail about the configuration of these camps, but they are basically, basically sites where people whose asylum applications have been rejected are being placed to, uh, in the words of the former Minister of Immigration of Denmark, make life as intolerable as possible for residents so that they will leave Denmark or self-deport, basically. We hear in the clip the calm voice of uh, this Mills, um, a prison officer, conveying the message of a lifetime sentence, saying that you will stay here until you die. Later on in the clip, uh, or in your conversation, I remember, he goes on by saying, unless public opinion changes, although public opinion is not exactly in the favor of rejected asylum seekers at the moment. Now, some seven years on, we might, you know, uh, have to realize that he's been right. So we're showing the clip because we think it illustrates some of the themes we'll be talking about, uh, namely slow violence, um, its bureaucratic rationalization, and the ways through which it is framed to be misrecognized as not being violence at all. So I will just spend the remaining um, minutes on my first intervention talking a bit about how I'll ha I have come to understand border violence and some of the struggles of knowing it from you know, the perspective of someone who just entered as a researcher into a field where it is everywhere and uh, also everywhere we cannot, where we cannot necessarily see it. So when I speak of border violence now, I speak of the different forces that expose people to harm and constrain their freedom. Uh, they might be direct and visible, as in detention or deportation processes. They might be indirect and slow, waged through these ways of emptying life of meaning, um, exposing people to a state of injury without necessarily physically harming. And as Aya, another resident of the Danish deportation camp, put it, it denotes a state of being kept alive, but not allowed to live. And because borders draw on and produce racial hierarchies by determining who may be exposed to uh, state-sanctioned premature death, to borrow Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition, death here being physical and mental by the shortening and distortion, distortion of the conditions of survival and of life, death being social through dehumanization, deprivation of relationships and of a common future. Borders also draw on and they reproduce political and also epistemic violence uh, by erasing and constantly misrecognizing the voices of those targeted by it and their foundational critique um, of the structures that they're being subjected to. And so I just want to talk quickly now ish <laughs> about sort of coming to these sites as a researcher where I, I mean now some eight years ago started my research running straight into what we might call the spectacular sites of border violence the border crossings the tension centers where power is so immediately recognizable where abuses are common and dehumanization seems so clear to us and Documenting violence in its most spectacular forms might seem intuitive, you know, both for its urgency and also for strategic reasons. Um, and I think this has to do in part with how border laws and border regimes have codified and hence made invisible so much of its underlying and endemic violence that uh, it makes it unrecognizable at first sight, perhaps, until those moments when it produces what we might call, you know, excessive violence, human rights violations, uh, and other forms of abuses. And so those are the ones that are coded and recorded by human rights organizations, by researchers, by journalists who come there and try to inquire into those excessive instances of violence, proving that hence that this violence exists. But Focusing on the excessive or the exceptional, of course, risks contributing to normalizing and hiding other forms of violence. Um, and even though, of course, mobilizing around instances of abuse, uh, of violence in excess can be tactical to forward progressive claims for rights and recognition and, you know, to help individuals, let's not like disregard that. Um, this game of making violence legible to law and to the state 
to make claims that this is an instance of violence legible to the law and to the state and to the general public is a game that is the state is better at uh, waging than than most of us i think moreover i think to compel people who criticize the system as people have been doing from these sites of deportation camps um i'll come back to that in in a second but to compel those people to represent their suffering in a way that becomes legible to the state and in the narrow confines uh, that of, of what recognizes suffering is a form of epistemic violence because it forces people to accept the terms uh, that actually set and causes in a way their oppression. Um, and so just some examples of what I mean from, from these sites where uh, I later came to, to look way more at thanks to Steve and thanks to also some of the uh, organized struggles that you were part of uh, waging from within the camps. Um, of seeing sort of these slow, these mundane forms of violence and how they're articulated to slowly break people down, right? Um, this th forms of legal violence, they include situations where Danish prison guards uh, are holding down a resident onto the floor, squeezing them hard, and then claiming that they're using power, not violence, because their actions are endorsed by law. It includes situations where Swedish detention officials conduct suicide screenings of people who arrive in detention to determine whether they are at so-called risk of self-harm and then place if people do uh, articulate their distress, which most people do because they're at risk of deportation, they will be placed in solitary confinement, allegedly for their own protection. It includes situations where Danish deportation um, officials and prison officers in the camps are walking around the fences of the camp that you showed in the film clip in the beginning and say these fences are for protection, not for punishment. They're meant to uh, protect residents from outside intruders, not the other way around. And so in responses to critiques that the camps constituted a form of de facto indefinite detention, as we heard the prison officer say in the, in the beginning that you might actually have to stay here until the day you die. Prison officers would claim that, well, you know, the doors are not locked. So technically, residents are free to leave any time. But as another resident and activist in the camp, Baba, would underscore, we, if, if, if we're free to leave, we have nowhere to go and nowhere where we are allowed to go, except for the place where they want to deport us to. So then, because of this normalization and codification of these forms of mundane violence, if you will, when residents protest, which I mean, you did a lot, um, the responses will be that people are undeserving because violence, the violence they have been exposed to are not enough to warrant them asylum, of course. When reporting abuse, staff would say that they had discretionary authority to, again, hold people down, to enter into their rooms while they shower and so on. Or when asking for permission to cook one's own food, uh, the response would be that people are, you know, ungrateful, greedy, welfare abusers, and so on and so forth. And I think none of this is essentially new to people who are familiar with these sites. Um, but what concerns me is the reproduction of, um, or how the general public, how much of media, and also much of the research that uh, that I've been engaging with in this uh, field uh, and in these sites um, does not recognize this as, uh, as instances of violation, as instances of harm. Um, and so it places the burden on people exposed to these structures to time and again articulate their critique, to time and again show their vulnerability or show their suffering. Um, Toni Morrison says of racism that it operates through destruction by forcing people to prove time and again their victimhood and keeping them from doing the work of dismantling racism. And I think borders work in much of the same way. And just to round off before I hand over to Steve, um, I know this many have been writing and, you know, um, writing about this and foregrounding it. Uh, Steve will talk later on about initiatives that are about educational initiatives where you try to to uh, challenge this um, epistemic injustice. Uh, and um, I would just m maybe like to 
round off with a question, uh, which is one that our friend Sharon Kostrevi usually poses, paraphrasing uh, Gertrude Spivak, that the subaltern can of course speak, but the white world refuses to listen or they cannot listen. Um, so that begs the question, of course, of what voices and what critiques of borders and border violence can, you know, media, the public and the academic hear? And what violences can they recognize? And if they cannot, what are the costs they imagine that such a recognition would have to entail? Um, so with that, I'll just stop for now and hand over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Anika, for a very elegant presentation of uh, the talk. I will do the opposite of you. Um, not only that I'm best at just talking and just um, expressing myself rather than writing down. I also like to do that in a way to try to challenge the status quo, like um, the structures of academics and the way it works. Uh, so that being said, um, on our topic today on state violence, violence itself, and how we recognize one's violence and whose violence do we actually recognize? So if you're speaking from a border perspective, I think when I came into Europe, it was very difficult not only to explain why you're here, even though I am literally explaining it, but it took me time to realize that my story did not fit into the status quo. Like, who are refugees? What's, what makes up a refugee, right? And over time, I realized that this the violence underneath that itself, the censoring of your story, the censoring of your lived reality, the censoring of your suffering has not been legitimate enough um, to be granted safety, to be granted protection. That's, that in itself, it's violence. Right, like to for one to tell you, well, if you've made it here, if you're here, this is what the um, immigration officers often tell you. If you made it here, at least this was what I was told. If you made it here, which means if you left Greece, if you left every other place you have passed through and made it here, which means you are not in danger because if you are in danger, you wouldn't have made it here. Which means. If I was really going through something terrific, uh, uh, terrifying, um, at the fear for my life, that means I would have died on the way if that danger actually did exist, in their words. So over time, I began to realize not only the state, also people on the street, common citizens, that includes just general people, general citizens, that includes the police, that includes the immigration officer, that includes the social worker, that includes um, every institution, actually, to try to prove again and again that you being there is legitimate, that your story, that your lived experience, what you're going through at the time is legitimate, and that what you're facing, their question is violent in itself. I realized that it was difficult to talk about violence because our understandings were quite dif different in the sense that they themselves being the police for the state at that time, they don't recognize the, the, the violence that they perpetrate as, as they are talking to you, how much they sense for you, how much they try to show how much they are conditioned, they are conditioned to think in a certain way. So I realized that uh, my understanding of violence, and most especially most people in the West, and their understanding of violence cannot be the same. So if you go back to the clip where um, Anika just played previously, um, one would see very much that this is a state-sponsored detention only for people who were rejected, not that they committed any crime, but they rejected, they were rejected from the asylum, simply that the state did not recognize their suffering, where they are coming from. Most of us coming from Africa, they call us economic migrants. That excuses the state, the responsibility to take responsibility for us being displaced. 
they are forgotten even when they say economic migrants that there is a lot of violence on the or there, there's a lot of war <laughs> um economic my economic war the start that the west actually imposed on these countries which is making people to flee they forget all of those things uh, but at the same time just using the term economic migrants to disguise to to um dismiss your claim of asylum so one simply can see the violence that the, that there is there even though we know very well that this not to talk about the suffering you went through before you came here. Um, at some point, there was a psychologist who came to one of these detention centers. And I went to this meeting. They wanted to, um, how do you say, to, to kind of look at us to see if we are truly traumatized from these centers. And I was baffled by the psychologist coming there to, um, to find this out. I mean, is it is it not common sense that somebody who has been taken away rights, um, their rights have been taken away? Is it not normal detained every um, how is it called? Every aspect of life, rights, the human right that one deserves, the the ability to sleep when you want, to wake up when you want, to eat when you want, to decide what you eat, what you put in your body. Um, we, we are being force fed because you cannot take the food out of the, 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 canteen, the canteen. You cannot, you must eat it there. And if you don't want to eat it, you leave. We are being starved. Nobody was talking about this. Nobody was talking about this. Um, how do you, uh, the, what's the word now? Nobody was talking about this violence that was being unleashed on us on a day to day basis. So I was asking the psychologist, you went to an institution, you went to school. You were educated, you know what common violence looks like, and you're here to ask us. You don't need to come to ask us. You just need to look at the structure for you to realize that this was already a very violent place for any human being to be. But you coming to ask us that question simply means that you don't know your job. But at the same time, you also realize that um, the definition of violence at least from her perspective, from the perspective of people who work there, from the perspective of the system that I've made of the place, um, is that they don't understand the violence that they unleash, or they don't even understand the, the violence because in order for them to unleash such violence, which means it has been acceptable, they themselves have accepted it, or in some, in some ways have experienced it, and have accepted that that is the condition for a human being to be, but only that we can have to select which human being is. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is this, in order for one to dehumanize one, you as an individual have to be dehumanized first to do that. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that, oh, well, I'll give another example from that very conversation. The lady who came for this, um, who was a psychi psychiatrist who wanted to uh, kind of look at us, um, did ask that and what she was trying to figure out that if we here had post-traumatic stress and which was another absurd question because our stress and our trauma is still continuing it's it's not in the past it's still a process so we cannot yet even think of ourselves as people something post <laughs> post but i mean why is it going on so I, again, I, I try to say to her, what you're saying also does not make sense because you're in this center where something is continuing. It's not, it's not a past. She's like, no, but I'm talking about when you were coming in your country. It, it doesn't make any sense anymore, first of all, because we are in this center, which means the state, the institution does not recognize that those stories, what you're trying to figure out now, those post-traumatic stress, they do not recognize that we have been stressed. They do not re recognize that we have traumas from these journeys. That's why we are here in the first place. So in the in the real sense, we don't have past uh, post-traumatic stress, stress because we are having that as we I'm talking to you, as you're here, it's a continuous, um, it's a continuous lifestyle. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that the states, the Western states, such as like Denmark, uh, Germany, here, where I am here now, they don't understand violence, neither do they, they don't understand violence that they unleash, uh, at least in their terms of violence. 
and they don't understand or well, should I say, they understand it, but do not want to hear it. They, they know what they are doing, but also do not want you to be able to say it, to be able to educate or like humanize. When I say this, some people do get upset. Why should it come from me? Why should it come from somebody who they think is not? Why should you educate me? Um, but I think in order for a lot of people here in the West to be able to see a human being from, the, from a human perspective, they themselves need to be human. They themselves need to be humanized themselves again. I'm talking about academics. I'm talking about people in different, um, how do you say it, in different um, professions in this society, to be able to see that they themselves have been dehumanized to see people in this way. At first, they need to go through that rehabilitation, as we are also trying to go through the rehabilitation of becoming um, people that. Um, at, again, when we talk about post-traumatic stress, to talk about post-traumatic stress, we need to we need people here also to start to humanize themselves in order for us to be able to um, understand that violence is not only to those you um, give it to, but also the person who is doing the violence in itself is also uh, in a in a in a way uh, very dehumanized themselves. So it's we both. I'm not talking about just uh, refugees or migrants. I'm talking about citizens here in the in, in the West. I'm talking about citizens. Uh, I'm talking about academics. I'm talking about um, policymakers. Everyone in this in, in, in different uh, professions have to understand in order for us to have a better world, that in order for us, you to be a human, I have to be human. In order for I to have rights, you need to have right. So when we write, when we go to research, we need to see people in that light. We need to see them as human first. We need to understand that the conditions in which they are living, They're talking about the spectacular that uh, um, I think I talked about in the first place, that this spectacular is not, even though we are conditioned to, to see that spectacular, that is not the only violence that does exist, that there is a lot of violence, not even by the way we go there, what we want to see, what we are conditioned to see, what we are conditioned to write about, that a lot of these things, we need to decolonize ourselves about it. We need to humanize ourselves about it before working with people in order to understand, to um, also educate other people in the society. So I don't know if I'm taking too much time out of this now. So I will give it back to you a little bit, Anika. So I just wanted to tell a little bit of this uh, in order for us to go into like um, both knowledge and what sort of knowledge that there is and what kind of knowledge that we are conditioned to accept. Um, so I just want to underline the violent aspect of it and how it also works on a day-to-day -day basis that we may not recognize. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. That's so, uh, uh, that is really great and thought-provoking, your intervention. And uh, I just wanted to react with two things and then hand back to you. Um, the first was about when you retold the story of the, psych the psychiatrist, the professional who comes into the camp um, to document or to prove that people have post-traumatic stress while not being able to recognize its causes. Um, it makes me think about how whenever people uh, who are impacted by border violence are spoken to, it is to carve out or to extract their testimonies or stories, but this is not considered as knowledge on a regular basis, right? This is not considered knowledge until a psychiatrist has filed it as a report and produced it, then it's, you know, then it's um, um, a health professional's knowledge or an academic has written about it and theorized it and then it becomes an academic knowledge. But in and of itself, people's stories, people's experiences will usually not pass the test of westernized uh, scientific um, uh, ideas of, of, you know, what, what is westernized scientific uh, knowledge production supposed to be like. Um, and then I was thinking also, as you spoke of uh, the need to prove oneself deserving um, and the hierarchies that these these systems of oppression also create between now you mentioned, you know, people who seek asylum who will have been deemed to not been exposed to violence enough, uh, others who are criminalized. And then, of course, you're basically out of the game of deservingness, right? It brings to mind what the Palestinian writer and poet Mohammed al Kurd calls the politics of appeal. Um, which he talks about in his uh, Edward Said lecture earlier this year, 
which is about, you know, to be heard, the subaltern need to present themselves as the perfect victim, to show a suffering body, a bleeding heart, and to never uh, question the system, to never having been, um, never exposed its violence, and to never have responded with violence, whether that is by, you know, people who are in the camps, they're criminalized for leaving the camps um, to meet their loved ones. They're criminalized for, because they're you know hungry or they need to smoke, for uh, shoplifting. And these sort of administrative violations or so-called property crimes, um, which are ways of making oneself live, not just survive, right? Uh, they are considered, you know, um, that cancels you from, from the possibility of recognition as such a victim. Um, and then about the dehumanization of, uh, uh, I mean, you basically what you, I, I hear when you speak, it's what um, MSSR calls, so when he says that colonization has dehumanized not only the colonized, but also, and so importantly, the colonizer. Um, and I think academia is asking us to do this too, the academic institution, university as such, because of how it asks us to both, I mean, accept uh, the sort of westernized supposed universal point of view, uh, the I think, uh, or I conquer, therefore I think, therefore I am paradigm. And it forces us to um, prove that we have severed our relationships to other human beings. And if we don't do that, we're accused of, you know, biases and activism and I'm not being professional. Um, so I wonder, and there would maybe just throw it back the question to you, Steve, uh, because you're talking about education also as a way of humanizing, um, uh, humanizing those of us who have been dehumanized by our participation in the structures of oppression. Uh, and uh, what I know that you're engaged in some educational initiatives and processes in this regard. And I wondered if you want wondered if you want to talk a bit about that. Yeah. Um... I say that, and I also maybe for anyone who might find it a bit uh, provoking, because I have been uh, accused of insulting uh, people when I say that. But unfortunately, I cannot always, uh, because I would like people to recognize that um, the way we see things, or the way they do things here, and see other human beings is not human. Um, that being said, so. If you could uh, repeat your question to me, what you wanted me to clarify on uh, a little bit more, Annika. Um, no, I asked because, I mean, previously too, you were talking about um, educational initiatives and ways uh, of, and strategies for um, challenging this epistemic uh, violence and the ways in which people are on the sharp end of border violence and other structures of oppression that they, their voices are misrecognized. And although that you're involved with Silent University and in other uh, movements that try to challenge these structures. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about that. I mean, at first, the educational system or the intellectual in the Western world, I, I have them to blame a lot for the ignorance of the population in Europe or in the West. We give a refugee tour here in Germany. So what we do is like, we take people to the refugee camps. We talk about why we're here, uh, what has brought us here from different countries, from different communities, from different perspectives. And on one of those tours, the students were furious with us, uh, asking us, uh, such as like we are trying to ask them, do you, how many of you have computers, uh, cell phones, uh, where these minerals comes from? So we have data of like how many people have died in Congo, for instance, in a certain mine, uh, where these uh, minerals go to, and how it ends up in their phone and how they are like uh, complicit in one way or the other by buying the phone or so. And the teacher was furious with us uh, for... Um, giving the students such a hard uh, home homework and also telling them things without real concrete. And I'm like, what exactly is it you want more? Like, no, that what we are doing in these tours is like, um, I I'm trying to remember her word now, um, to destroy the Western way of life. 
which I told her, which is the problem, is the Western way of life that has brought us here. So you as a teacher who are teaching these students are now today opposing what we are telling these students. In essence, you are one of those people who have written, have taught a lot against or for the capitalist society, colonial societies that has brought us here. And she, out of anger, walked away and walked away with the students. Um, I have had a critic also from the same, uh, another tour, uh, from university academics uh, who came from Sweden, Germany, and Denmark, who attended the tour. On in the in the in the tour, one of the uh, academics was asking me what. What is my level of education? And I told her that I did not actually attend universities and uh, just basic uh, education. And then she said, well, you don't have the right to criticize what we write, how we write it, how what we do as in researchers, because you do not know how the educational system works. And I'm like, Okay, I cannot argue with you if that's your choice. Uh, if you definitely see you're not hearing everything I'm saying all along. So I left that conversation. So what I want to say is that a lot of the population, not only are they uh, indoctrinated or conditioned, not only through the schools, the medias, um, the, uh, our institutions, but, I think the educational system here has a lot of roles. Not only is it complicit in conditioning and uh, indoctrinating its citizens of um, not the truth, historical truth, not the, neither does it support anyone who, uh, let's say researchers, academics who, who dare to figure it out and try to write it. Actually, we can tell stories or we can give testimonies of um, academics who we know have been thrown out of the academic system for writing what the academic um, system does not want to hear. So, but we also know that there is a lot of academics who have written a lot of, let's say, racist things who have supported the, the, the invasion of uh, many countries, the, colon the colonization of many countries, their work continue to be used today as curriculums in the schools. So a lot of a lot of us who are part of the academic settings, or a lot of people, I'm not, a lot of people who are part of the academic settings have a lot of jobs in to do, not only to rescue themselves from the system and to transform that system so that it can be inclusive and also allow for real um, exchange of knowledge to happen to share, for the sharing of knowledge to happen. So what I'm saying in essence is that people who are involved in this institution have the responsibility, not only the military as we talk about, not only the politicians, um, to also write real history, not from their perspective, what the institution want them to write, but from the perspective of people in the world, from every aspect to go to do real human research, no, like you know that that does not is not biased. I don't know if that is actually really possible, but to work with people in order to bring real research to the public, what is truthful, what is despite who how biased it might be or how um, biased it might be found in this part of the world, to still do it, to collaborate with um, people who are in these situations. Like I was trying to say, you cannot one cannot do research without the knowledge of people who are in that situation or who have lived through that situation. If anyone says it's a lie, they should try it and show me the research. So what I'm trying to say is not to exploit this continuation of exploiting the knowledges of people who are either oppressed, uh, people of color, people, the indigenous people, name it, people who are fighting for human rights to exploit these knowledges and use it for themselves and write it in the way the educational system or the institution wants it to be written. Um, so in other words, what I'm trying to say, what we try to do at the Silent University is for us to take ownership of our own research, take ownership of our own lived experiences. And then if we see academics or academics uh, um, 
institutions who come to us and really want to work uh, in, in the way we see um, work can be done with us. People who are in this situation themselves, what to work with them to produce, to enlighten, to educate the society, we are willing to do that, but we are also willing to work independently on ourselves, which is what we've been doing all along, to try to own our own stories, to write our own narratives, so that it's not always written for us, um, to write in our own language that is not the language of the system, but to frame things in the language that everyone would understand, not some coded if you don't go to the university, if you don't go to the educational um, institution that you cannot read it nor write. We want everyone to be poets. We want people to be writers. We want people to be researchers, to write about what they experience, to write about or to be part, tell it, uh, storytelling through what they experience themselves and own it to themselves. So that's what we try to do. And people who might want to work with us in that way, not only tell our own stories, but also for them to learn how to tell the stories here themselves. That can be a way to sort of like try to humanize ourselves, to relate to each other in order for us to create a, a, this new utopian world that I sort of tried to raise before, whereby when I write about the human rights, about me, that I'm writing the human rights of every human being. When people are writing about human rights, uh, are writing about some violation that they realize that that's, they are not writing for some certain people that they are writing for themselves. Because whatever violence that is being used here is usually trans transported to somewhere else. And whatever violence we allow here, eventually, or somewhere else, we eventually come back to us. So this is my response to you, Annika, for this long, short question. <laughs> no, that's great. So, Thank you so much. I don't know if we should open the floor to people. Let's do it. For any questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. This has been yeah, a really interesting and um, thought provoking discussion. And so many things have resonated uh, with me and made me think, and it's kind of hard to know where to start or ask a question. So I'll just, I guess I'll ask a question and then also just kind of throw out a reflection about how you know, what we often kind of conceptualize as violence can often quite be dynamic depending on who is the subject, right? And so like, again, just thinking of a very like topical issue of Palestine and Israel and who's more entitled to certain violences based on their location and how they're racialized or viewed in the media can be completely different even if the exact violence is the same or even worse in some cases. Um, so this like these, yeah, this colonial logics about who's more deserving and, you know, some slow violences that we would not necessarily consider violence because it's codified and legalized um, against um, illegalized or migrantized people. That same violence that would then be enacted on a citizen is seen as violence just because of this barrier categorization. Um, so that's just something that I was reflecting on quite a bit uh, through the talk. And then also, I guess for me, you know, I'm, I always wonder with how to facilitate, and obviously Steve, since you have much more experience talking and educating people, maybe this is directed more at you, is how to create people to be more receptive to hear. Like, because I think as humans, we often have this resistance to be challenged or to be worried that we've done wrong, that we're part of this oppressive system. How, and so then there is this resistance where as the teachers that you talk to, you know, don't want to hear it. Like, how do you break that barrier to allow them to be receptive to critique themselves to, I don't know, if that makes sense. Yes, um, at, some, at some point, also through my conversation with Annika, Julia, I, I, or oh, activism, most of the times when I go to like the left, <laughs> 
left um, people, uh, organizations, uh, activism, and we're having meeting on like either deportation or the social issues. Um, I am often very accused of, uh, yeah, being very ignorant and just talk that my words don't, I don't understand that my words hurt people uh, or like, I don't know, not taking into account people's feeling before I say the things. And to an extent, I realized um, if I want people here in the West to hear me, at least one of the first things they accuse me of, like he's talking in a low voice, the way they can understand, not very hostile, and also the mind the languages you use, so it's not insultive. This was also why I was apologizing now for for any of uh, if I the words I use uh, might be insulting or might be anyone might find it offensive. Um, to some extent, I I thought I thought that uh, I still think in some situations it's my responsibility if I want people to hear me. But what do you do when you're talking to somebody who doesn't want to hear you, <laughs> right? Like it's not about the language you use. It's not as what tone you're you're talking. It's not, but rather the subject you're talking about. And most especially when you, again, who is the victim to hear from? I don't want to be the victim. I didn't choose to be the victim at the first place, right? So um, people should stop giving me that label and then accusing me of trying to be a victim. Uh, that's why I'm talking in this way. That also excuses them from actually hearing what I want to say. So I have tried to jog it around to understand how do I engage in the conversation? How do I make people understand what I'm going through as a person? And without being dumped with all these either political views or how, um, you know, what I'm trying to achieve from that. The only thing I'm trying to achieve is understanding. Like people should understand that I'm a human. Like, so yeah, going back to your question, um, at some point, I also realized that it's not my responsibility. Most, most Germans here, at least in Europe, they claim that their infinite support for the Zionist regime in Israel, no matter what they do, is to be supportive because they have a guilt from their past. And to, to some extent, to many Europeans, yeah, they, they relate this struggle to the Israeli state. Again, I mentioned, despite the fact that they are Zionist, the government is Zionist, the, the politics all along has been very divisive, very destructive. Um, that what is happening there is an occupation for many years. We will all forget all about this. And we talk about October 7th or something else that has happened in the between, right? We forget about history. We forget about the violence that the people face every day. And then the, like, then talk about something else, yeah? And um, in some way, censoring what people have to say. Also, changing the topic of what we want to talk about, certainly, yeah? So I have been trying to understand also, because this is a topic now, the, the German guilds and what they have done, we have to understand why the, the support is infinite. But allies try to tell them, no, you can see from that way, or you can see that what you're doing also is committing double genocide. It's not about who is the victim, but it's rather like the people, <laughs> like who, how you have seen the life of people who live in some geographic place, that you don't associate to be you, that you don't associate to share the views of your system. And most especially that the existence of these people is a threat to your system or to, to your way of life, right? So we cannot have a conversation or we cannot, I cannot engage in a, a, a topic without using these words such as like occupation, um, genocide, uh, when it comes to the things an European doesn't want to hear. Already, that already stops the conversation for them. I, in that way, I become like in Germany, if I use such words, I become anti-Semite. 
Yeah. So when one can already label me, even I, I have, it has gotten to the point where somebody has told me that somebody was lecturing me how I was anti, I was racist to myself. Like literally telling me that I am a racist to myself. So it, it's, it's too absurd, right? So I don't know how to engage people or if it's my responsibility, like I said, it's not my responsibility. And to some extent, it is my responsibility if I want people to hear me. But that does not excuse the other person to say, well, um, yeah, I hear what I want to hear in the way I want to hear it. And I can only hear the, the truth I want to hear. It, say, a person like this, we don't have a conversation. We cannot have a conversation because the responsibility is always mine. So it's not, it's not equal in that respect. Can I add something briefly before, sorry, then I see Amani has, has their hand up. Um, yeah. I think in the context of border violence, and I mean also in a way that the, uh, what Vosti was talking about now, um, we are presented with borders as something, and there, I mean, in our view, what would be needed to be their abolition as, as being sort of a zero sum game where if borders disappear, then we will inevitably all lose, even though we have ample evidence that, that this is not the case. If militarized borders, if military apparatuses disappear, then people will be threatened, whereas actually it seems to be the exact opposite empirically and historically, right? Um, so I think, and that's why, I mean, Stephen, I, I think we're both in, in different ways engaging with this, border, both language and the theorizations of, of border abolition as a way of showing that, you know, creating more conditions of, of, of freedom is not making anyone safer. And whether that goes for um, the Swedish or Danish welfare state, where the deprivation of rights and uh, the limiting of resources for uh, people who are positioned as migrants is presented as a way of protecting the national population. Whereas in fact, what we see is that that hollows out the protections of all in time. It becomes part and parcel of dismantling uh, the welfare system, labor rights and so on. So shifting that conversation and I guess showing that what we, you know, even though not equally, but uh, we do not engage in struggles for out of compassion, but out of all of our survival. Um, and, and I guess that's one way it's not necessarily going to be accepted by all, but I think that's uh, that's an important thing to to keep in mind. Uh, but sorry, Amani. Thank you so much, and thank you for facilitating the space. I think this is a really important conversation. Um, and and thank you so much for for your thoughts, Stephen, on, on your experiences as well. Um, I think um, just to introduce the angle I'm coming to this, I, I do um, urban research in Denmark looking specifically at um, housing policies. And I feel like a part of what we're discussing here, um, I, I kind of see the deportation centers in the Nordic as an entryway to look at border politics in general within these spaces. And what I often think about when I look at housing policies is how border control in Denmark is not necessarily at the border. It follows individuals around. And one thing, a lot of the things that you were talking about, Stephen, in your education of people visiting, uh, visiting you and the tours you're doing is this idea of there's a lack in, there's an ignorance there, but I think there's more to it than just ignorance. And I kind of find, especially within an ethno-nationalistic context that Denmark is, um, which Israel also is, and I think there's there's similarities in those comparisons. I think in this ethno-nationalist pr perspective, we actually have to speak about epistemicide. So this idea of destroying certain types of knowledge and undermining certain types of knowledges, including the knowledge that you present, Steve, based on your very important and ingrained experiences of these border politics. Um, it, it's more maybe a commentary, but also maybe something I want us and want you guys to to kind of bring up and you, Steve, to kind of maybe play around with. Because if we if we don't give them these people who undermine you the benefit of the doubt and actually see this as something uh, a, an expression of something structural within society, these societies. Um, there's something wider to tackle here because deportation centers are not just a, a violence in ignorance. It's actually very intentional if you look at what politicians, how politicians have have constructed it. Like we've seen it, like maybe for people who don't speak Danish, haven't seen the development, but the, the, the very violent 
discourse that has has been the basis of these deportation centers. There's a reason why you felt that violence. And that is that is a very important knowledge that was intentional. Um, and it, it just, it came out in a lot of the things that you were talking about. I know we're about to run out of time, but I wanted to just yeah. call back at you if you have any. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I said to Annika also when we started is just that we had only one hour to, to, to for this discussion. It's too short for such a discussion. Um, but uh, in the next three minutes that we have, um, I can briefly also touch on this topic now that you're raising. Um, actually, in reality, I don't think it's really ignorance that people don't know. Because each time we keep on talking about, there's a lot of things that has been produced. People have been talking, right? Because again, people don't want to hear it. It's obvious, it's there. But in reality, people know that this system benefits them. Most especially white Europeans know this, right? I mean, if you're talking about the war uh, in either in Russia, in Ukraine, uh, in uh, Afghanistan or in Iraq of recently, uh, in Palestine, name it, or the killing of, or the destruction of uh, Libya, right? Uh, all of these things have happened in my lifetime now. So I have been always been trying to get into discussion. So I was actually, again, in another toxic discussion with someone, and I'm like, you know what? In this system, most especially in, with the invasion of uh, Ukraine, I said, I, you know what? Actually, despite the fact that I, like, wholeheartedly share my my solidarity with Ukrainians and so on. But somehow I know that this war was not um, Ukrainians versus Russia. I know it's uh, the US and the war power women. But somehow that I will want the not the I will want the Ukrainians to win, but that the Western states that support it is destroyed. And someone someone says uh, actually someone very close to me says like what what are you talking about? Hell no, I don't want Russia to, to win. I mean, and I don't want my states to be destroyed. I'm saying, yes, I want the German states to be destroyed. Like it's what it has done is incredible. And the person tells me, but this is my state. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> but you are friends. And I'm like, what do you expect from me? I mean, uh, in reality, this state that you are part of that, even though we are friends, which is also another toxic thing between us sometimes, right? That you don't understand that the violence that it put it, that it puts on me, it's really really hard for me to live on a day to day basis. So therefore, that I want it destroyed. So if you're supporting the very state that oppresses me, you don't only have I don't only have a problem with the state, but also with you. So what I want to say with that is that a lot of the times our friends, our people around us, our colleagues, um, our neighbors, our landlords, uh, the institutions are very, very supportive of the very state that has not only displaced us, those in diaspora, it has colonized, it has taken our histories, it has made us into what we are today, very confused people. So in, the, in reality, what I want, or what each of us who have come from these diasporas would want is actually the abolition of that state, not restructuring, not, um, for, for for it to have and to continue its oppression. But when you say that you have suddenly have a problem with this, your friend, you have a problem with this, your colleague, because they are very much involved. They are part and parcel of that state. And they don't see themselves different, even though they don't sometimes can deny it. And say, oh yeah, well, what the state is doing, I don't really share. But they know that it is. For instance, when they say our national interest, in some part of the world, uh, they know that that is exploitation. They know that what either the German state or the US or each of the European states, what they mean by that policy is that we want to keep on taking, taking, taking the things for free. We want to keep on displacing, displacing people. We want to keep on killing, killing people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but at the same time, when we talk about that very policies that they have, that's what it does is displace us, take our homes, take our resources. People are like, yeah, but we support that policy. So what I'm saying is that even most of the people, your neighbor, your landlords, most of us do not understand how we are the police of the state. We do not understand how we are the social, how we are part of like the parcels, the, the small particles 
that makes the state functions. Until we start to recognize this, decolonize this, we cannot be human ourselves. That's what I meant by dehumanizing ourselves. Until we stop to partake in that system that dehumanizes other people and work for the rights of other people, uh, or produce or contribute to institutions that, you know, humanizes other people in the other part of the world and not dehumanize them. Until then, um, we will continue to be, how do you say it, um, to be part, to, to, to produce, reproduce what the system wants us to do all along. So. Yeah. Thanks so much. I see now that people are starting to drop out and I guess we should run yeah. out. Uh, but Amani, I just want to say thank you so much for raising that. And I think also this is something to bring with us, or I mean, I completely agree that it is because of an active endorsement and investment in the structures of injury that uh, violent border regimes are permitted to continue. And it goes for the Danish ghetto laws. It goes for, you know, uh, the production and the perpetuation of the internal racial other as well as the supposed external one. And I'd love to connect with you and your research and hear more about it because this sounds fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you so much, everyone who, who listened and hung in there with us. Um, yeah. You continue this conversation in, in more, more venues. Hopefully. Thank I thank you a lot also. And have a great day, you all. Bye. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> Anka. <laughs> hey. Oh. And <laughs> yeah, it's just me and you now, no? Oh. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, did I stop recording? No. Did it do that? No, I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>